Good evening, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. We're so happy to be back in studio. Um, if you didn't know, you're tuned in right now to the Focus TV. Mm -hmm. So glad that you are tuned in. Uh, if you've been here before, thanks for coming back. If this is your first time, welcome. Um, joined by Octavia Wyatt, Mr. Cardell Dudley. We got Damo Rowe over there working the gift machine. Um, and we, we got a lot for you guys tonight, man. We've been busy the past seven days or so. I mean, exhausted. If you guys follow us on social media, we were in two places at once last night. So, you know, that, that's kind of what the vibe's been the past seven days. But the highlight that you just saw, um, you talked to me already about it. But uh, to the good folks at home, what was it like taking in that GW Howard game? I mean, it was good. You know, uh, the best thing about covering um, GW, you know, for, well, since I've been covering them, they don't really, you know, they always have a quality schedule. So you get to see a lot of teams from around the country um, that – you may not pay attention to that, you know, like the ESPNs of the world may not blow up unless they start making noise late in the season. But, um, you know, they always got a jam-packed schedule where you kind of get to get a feel for what's out there. And um, Howard, you know, they definitely going to make some noise in the media. You know, I mean, obviously GW, they won 84-75 as everybody saw in the highlight. But they got pushed, you know. Howard swung back. I guess most people came in thinking that GW would kind of just smack on it. And even then, it was still like GW's young. So it was like, let's see how the, you know, the freshmen that are still there, how they grew up. And they grew and they showed up. You know, Jair Bowden, Arnaldo Toro. You know, Bowden had about, you know, I mean, he, he had, I mean, 17. Toro finished with 11 and 8. You know what I'm saying? They both played well. Um, Patrick Steves, the senior, he had 16 and 8. Watanabe, Utah Watanabe, the best player, senior all-conference guy, posting near triple-double, 19 points, 11 rebounds, and seven blocks. You know, go figure, you know. So um, I think he's the, the closest maybe in GW history to getting a triple-double with blocks, you know what I'm saying. So that's unheard of. But he's, he's also in the running for defensive player of the year. You know, and he definitely got a shot at playing in the league if he can continue to be consistent. But Howard, you know, they they not your average Howard team, man. They got a dangerous backcourt, dangerous. They got a freshman, um, R.J. Cole. I knew the name sounded familiar, but when I looked him up after the game, I understood. He played at St. Anthony's on the ball early, mm -hmm. so that boy can play. Like he 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 came in no fear. I mean, he was tearing them up, man. Like I was like, he play he plays with the poise of a senior, and that's why I thought he was like an older senior, somebody that's been there for a while. But then he's a true freshman, 17. He had higher offers. He just chose to go there because he wanted to make his his name and also have a chance to play right away. But also, you know, education, Howard and everything like that. He he he's kind of a thoroughbred. He he, he looks at more than basketball, which I respect. You know what I'm saying? So, um and then and the sophomore, he's all my yeah, first team preseason. That's Charles Williams Charles Williams, yeah. You know, he had twenty one points. I mean dunking all over G, you know what I'm saying? I mean, so uh with those two they got a chance. You know, they, I mean, I understand like Morgan State's of the world and Central, North Carolina Central, they dominate the me at, um, they might be a little bit more deeper, but with those two, they got a shot. No, it's not bad at all. Like you were telling me, um, you wouldn't be surprised if uh, the points point guard you just mentioned, a freshman, if he doesn't finish out his college career at Howard. Oh, they the biggest school's definitely going to get him. You know how it is now is um, if you've been slept on and you get to a, like a lower major and you do work, or well, the high major's going to come call him. And, you know that I don't. You know it's kind of a debate. Is it because a lot of the high majors don't evaluate talent, or they just playing a political game, getting players because they're hyped? That's what the AAU folks are pushing. Right. Um, you know it's a debate that you know it's going on right now. But you know a lot of these lower level guys come in, they they go right to work. So what 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 happened over the summer <laughs> and they seen year, you know, and the, that was different from the year where they might have been overlooked. So but he's definitely ready and obviously playing for Barber early, senior. Um, Legend, man. I mean, you got to be ready, you know. He, he'll break you down and make you quit if you're not built tough. So, you know how that go. All right, man. So, that that's just one of many games <laughs> yeah. that uh, a member of the Focus TV team has attended in the past week, man. Um, we got so much more tonight. Got a great guest. But well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come right back, get into this great, uh, this wonderful uh, conversation with our guest this evening. You're watching the Focus TV. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Welcome back to the Focus. Um, first, want to say welcome to Coach John Zito at John Carroll. How are you doing this evening, Coach? I'm good, man. I appreciate you having us on. I appreciate it. Nah, man. We thank you for making the time. Man, the season's already started. We know you're kind of busy. Uh, you know, it's grind season for you guys as well. So that being said, uh, Cardell, 
let you lead off this interview. We'll jump in a little later. All right, man. What's going on, Coach? Appreciate you coming on. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. How you doing, man? Doing real good. Um, one of my, my first question for you is what motivated you to get into coaching following a successful career at UMBC? Yeah, it, uh, you know, I did, I did eight, nine years total in, uh, in college and had a great experience. was very fortunate to get in early. Um, and, and uh, I have a young family, man. I have a one and a half year old. Um, and, and as most people know, college coaching, uh, is very family friendly. Um, very demanding and I still wanted to stay around the game and when the opportunity of John Carroll came up um, you know coach Tony Martin who was the previous coach did a fantastic job and uh, very well known program that, that I uh, that I, I was very interested in so glad it worked out and uh, you know I, I, I just like teaching young kids and, and helping young kids uh, I, I almost enjoy helping them more off the floor man you know um of the relationships you can build, and, and uh, I, I've, I've enjoyed that more so than the actual coaching. Piece, I got to be honest, just, just being able to help the young kids and their families with the recruiting process, and just the little nuances that kind of go along with everything that, that goes with this basketball, this basketball thing these days. Speaking of helping them on and off the court, you know, coaching at the D1 level um, at UMBC. Uh, for players and aspiring coaches, and all, as well as the parents, uh, what is a typical day in the life of a D1 coach and player? Yeah, uh, I don't know if there's any typical day for a coach. You know, it, it's you can you know, there's days you're in there at, at 5 a.m. for for track work or um, study hall or, or, or a practice that you might have to get in because you have flights. You know, uh, mid morning either to go recruiting or for a game, um, you know, but every day you're, you're checking on your guys. Typically you have a, you know, four or five guys you're responsible for academically and socially, you know, outside of the basketball responsibility. Um, so you're always constantly checking on your guys, uh, making sure they're doing well in school, making sure they're good with their, their academic advisors and their tutors. Um, you're doing class checks. Uh, you know, so much of college coaching is outside of what you see, you know, either Tuesday or Saturday night. You know, um, you're, you're only on the floor with these guys for two, three hours a day. Um, so, so the other, you know, 22 to 23 hours, man, you know, you, you're, you're either on the phone recruiting, talking to, uh, you know, families um, of, of your current guys. Or, or future guys, you know, future recruits. Um, you're on. You could be on the road recruiting. Uh, so there's there's really no typical day. I would say, it's, it's, and that that was probably for me the great great thing about coaching is, is every day was different. You know, no no two days were the same. Um, and then and then as far as the student athlete, uh, you know, typically you're you're getting up in the morning. And, and you have a food table or, or a mandatory breakfast. Um, you know, at UMBC, uh, we, we, we lift it a lot in the morning, so typically we get a lift in in the morning before class. And then, you know, mid-morning to, to mid-afternoon is typically when classes take place. Uh, and then, obviously, you have practice. Um, and then, you know, most guys are in – some kind of study hall, whether it's a monitor study hall or, or guys just getting in on their own to get get work done. Um, and then uh, some some programs have a mandatory food table at night or, you know, a dining hall at night to make sure these guys are eating well and, and getting the nutrition they need to get through the day. Um, and then some some programs have mandatory study hall at night. Uh, and, 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 you know, so the day is, is – is very busy, you know, for a student athlete. You know, I, I, some a lot of times guys need to get into the training room, which is another half hour to an hour, depending on, you know, if you're injured or you're just kind of going in there for maintenance. Um, so there's 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 not a lot of free time uh, for, for student athletes uh, that are that are trying to do it, you know, ser- on, on, on a serious level that are really trying to get things done. And we and we didn't even talk about getting in the gym on your own, 
You know, a lot of guys like to get, get shots up or work on stuff they want to work on outside of practice. So it's it's a full day, man. It's you know you're typically up you know six seven if you don't have anything earlier than that a.m. and then you're going to sleep. You should be going to sleep ten thirty eleven thirty. You know certainly no later than midnight because you need you need a good seven eight hours of sleep. Man. You really do to, to make sure you perform. All right, that was some good information, man. Everybody think it's sweet when you get up there, but you know it's a lot of work. I, I'll tell you, it, it really is, man. It really is. And it's funny, man, because, you know, you, you uh, during the recruiting process, you, you really want to make sure these guys um, are, 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 are fully invested in this basketball thing. If they can take the rigors of a full day like that, you know, for, for four years or five years, some guys. Um, and, and, you know, again, you, you, you try to, you try to, go through the recruiting process and, and, and make sure that these guys are, are capable and ready. And, and you know, not everybody you recruit is suited for. You know, talent-wise, sure, sure, but, but it takes a lot more than talent, man. It really does. It takes a certain, a certain guy, a certain individual um, that really is focused on what they want, uh, that's really driven, and that's very disciplined. Uh, I can't say that enough about the discipline. You know, self-discipline is, is, will take you um, as far as you allow it, you know, and, and that's what we talk about a lot in our program is self-discipline. No doubt, no doubt. Um, after you left UMBC, you took over at John Kerr, replacing standout coach Tony Martin, who had just led, you know, the Patriots to a 27-11 season, Baltimore Catholic League Championship. Um, the challenge was there to keep the momentum going and to push your imprint on the program. What steps did you take to make that happen? Yeah, uh, you know, Tony, Tony did a great job. Uh, you know, they lost a lot. You know, they, they graduated uh, five five seniors. Uh, all five of them were, were probably Division One guys. I'm sorry, they graduated four, and, and a guy transferred out, uh, who I believe had signed with a Division One school. Uh, but, you know, my thing was, was coming in and, and establishing – Local recruiting. Uh, you know, I know the, the, the previous couple of years, Coach Martin was there. Uh, he had a lot of international players mm-hmm. uh, with with just a few local guys. And you know, coming in, man, it was really important to establish John Carroll uh, as as a as a local as a local school that recruited local guys. Uh, that was my biggest thing. You know, off off the bat. Which, uh, and obviously, I think we were able to bring in Montez. We were able to bring back from Oak Hill. Uh, so that was a huge piece for us. Uh, we were able to bring in Cam Byers, uh, the incoming freshman, which was a huge piece for us. So, so I think our first year, you know, quote unquote, on the recruiting trail, you know, mind you, we got on. We, I got the job in May, June, early July. So kids were just getting ready to hit the road for July. Uh, and, and honestly, you know, I had to kind of re-recruit Emmanuel, you know, because there were kind of stuff out there that, that he might not return as well. Right. Um, so we had to kind of re-recruit him as well. Wow. When a player joins the program, what are your expectations of him on and off the court? Let's just say it again. When a player joins the program, what are your expectations of him on and off the court? Oh, yeah, sure. Um you know, again, being being at the college level, uh, we, we, you know, I tell my assistants, I tell our players, we're going to run this thing like a college program. We assume that if you're here, you have aspirations to play uh, somewhere at the next level. And, uh, you know, we, we hold our guys uh, to, the, to the utmost uh, character. Man. We, we talk about character a lot and what that means and what it means to have, you know, high character. Uh, and I think everything starts and ends right there, man. Uh, again, we can talk about the self discipline You know, obviously they have to be great students. John Carroll is a, is a pretty uh, well-known academic school, so, so the academic team, you know, is going to get taken care of uh, from, from the academic side. That's, that's not negotiable. Right. Uh, and then, you know, it, more so the more 
also the basketball, man, it's just, just making sure these guys are, are being young men, are being respectful young men, um, and, and that they're learning life lessons just as well as basketball, man. They, they really go in. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you have a guy that, you know, isn't disciplined or taking care of work in the classroom and they're always getting calls or emails about him, you know, screwing around in class, you know, you can expect the same results once you get into practice. That's probably those those go hand in hand. Uh, you know, so so making sure that you have guys that are focused, guys that know what they want, uh, and guys that are gonna take care of everything from from academic to social and, and obviously from an athletic right. you know, and, and, and making sure there's no slips on it. These guys have to check check every box every day. You know, uh, you know just because uh, we had a game and, and you know we got home late, you know, doesn't mean you can come to school late. You know, uh, in college, you're expected to get up for that 8 a.m. class, uh, just like the rest of your your classmates. You know, there's no exception there. Good to see guys get, get the understanding of that now, and, and they're prepared so they know what they're going to do for the next four years. All right. Um, you also you have arguably the best backcourt, not just the DMV, but maybe the country. And Kentucky commit Emmanuel quickly, and Rutgers commit Montez Mathis. Uh, what makes them special, and how were you able to help them? You know, check their egos at the door and play off one another to become the lethal tandem that they are. Yeah. You know, when again, when I got the job, you know, Montez was definitely a focus of mine to try and get back to, to the DMV. Uh, you know, we had heard that uh, he, had, he was no longer going to be at Oak Hill, uh, and, and we knew if, if we could get, you know, Emmanuel and Montez back together, they were close friends growing up, um, that, you know, we, we'd have a pretty good, a pretty good core. And uh, those guys, man, they're, they're, they're special kids. They, they really are. Um, you know, their work ethic is unbelievable. Uh, but, again, they're, they're good people. So it makes everything a lot easier, you know. Um, now, they, they, are, they are both fierce competitors, and they both want to win at whatever it is they're doing, whether it's a drill, whether it's a scrimmage, whether it's a game. Uh, whether on the same team or whether they're going against each other, and we certainly had they certainly had their battles, you know, going against each other, uh, and they they really really get after each other when they compete, you know, going head to head. But the great thing is, man, those those two are like blood; they're like brothers. Uh, so when it's all said and done, it's you know we're family at the end of the day, and and you know we're we're all in the black and gold jersey, so. Whatever happens that day happens, and, and again, at the end of the day, we're family. We're coming back together, and those guys do a great job of kind of setting that tone for our program. Uh, where, where, hey, we're gonna come in every day, and we're gonna compete. Again, whether we're on the same team or we're, whether we're we're going against each other, we're gonna compete and win. Uh, but again, when things are done, we're good, and, and we're moving forward together. Um, and, and again, it starts with them as, as young men. It's who they are. It's who they are at home. It's who they are with their families, with their friends. Um, it's, it's, it's who they are outside of basketball that makes them so special when they get to the basketball court. Right on. We hear from parents and players about the pressures during recruiting of you know players, especially highly coveted players like Quickly. How is it from the coaching aspect to help the players and their families get as much and the right information as possible to make a quality decision? Yeah, when I, when I when I got the job and I, and I spoke with you know the players and their families, I said, listen, you know I, I'll be involved with the recruiting process as much as you want me to be involved. Okay. You know because uh, you know everybody's recruiting process is different. Uh, there's there's no you know there's you know Montez's situation is the Daniels, the vice versa, it's just like any other player we have. Uh, so so that's the most important thing to get to get players and families and people to understand is, look, your situation is your situation. 
don't compare yourself. Don't relate yourself. Like, just look at your individual situation and move forward how you need to move forward and how your family needs to move forward. You know, I think a lot of times um, people get caught up in, in looking at somebody else's recruiting situation, and that that takes away from, you know, what you need to be focusing on and what and what's going on in, in, in your your recruiting world. So so getting them to, to really stay focused and, and – and, uh, Locking in to, again, to their own recruiting situation. And our guys did a great job of that. You know, I, I'll say this, man. We, we had pretty much everybody in the country come through, you know, uh, to recruit one one of those guys. And not just those two, but all of our guys were, were really good with just, you know, letting it be what it is and, and just working, just coming in working like they were there or whether, whether they were not there. Uh, and I think that's 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 another piece that you know um, you talk about the pressures of recruiting. <laughs> you have a guy like Coach Calipari and, um, or or some of those other bigger names that we're in, and and you know kids might feel a certain certain pressure, a certain type of way to perform. And our guys handled it well, man. It, it was just like another day, another day in the gym, and that's the way it should be. That's good. Uh, it's it's it's, and again, man, it it all goes back to, you know, the person they are, the people they are. Right, right. A player that you know we talked about the DMV Elite Eighty. Um, help me with his name. Uh, Yabu's goes again. Did I get it right? Oh yeah, Yabu. Uh, uh, right, Yabu. Go. Go all right, there we go. Um, how has he blended with the team, and you know, what's his ceiling as a player from the coaching you know aspect? Yeah, he, he's he's he fits right in, man. He, he's got a lot of character and a lot of personality. Um, he's he's uh, very, you know, the, the European kids, man, tend to be a, a little more uh, traveled, I guess. I mean, physically, but but more so emotionally and mm-hmm. mentally. Mm-hmm. Um, so they they bring a different feel and a different personality to a team, um, and he's fit right in, not just. Team, but into our school, into our campus as a whole, and uh, he's 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 a funny kid. Man. He's funny. He keeps laughing. He, he, they call he calls himself Easy, and everybody calls him Easy. Uh, and it kind of fits. It kind of fits who he is as as a kid and as a player. Um, but our guys have really taken him in, and, and he's taken to our guys. Um, and that's something you always kind of you know not worry about, but definitely something you think about uh, when you bring bring an international kid, especially a kid that can play. Right. Um, <clears throat> but he is, you know, he, he's got a shot to do something special. He's 67. He's long. He's really athletic. Um, he doesn't fit your typical European mold uh, from, the, from an athletic standpoint. You know, we, we tested at the beginning of the year, and he has a 32-inch stand, uh, standing vertical. And I think he jumps up to like a 41 inch, you know, on the on the on the two step vertical. So he can he can really fly, man. And uh, you throw that in with with the skill, you know. Obviously, most your people over they're very skilled. They can all shoot pass and dribble, and he can do those well. Uh, but when you throw in his athleticism and, and his mentality, uh, he's, he's pretty aggressive. For you know, again, when you talk about European players. Some of them sometimes they get labeled uh, a little, a little more timid, or you know they shy away from contact. Where he looks to initiate contact, uh, and he doesn't, he doesn't mind the physicality of, of the American game at all. Uh, you know, so he's he's only a junior. Uh, he's young, and, and you know he's got a year to kind of see what you know how these older guys are, are attacking. Uh, the game and, and just life in general and, and the time it, it, it you have to put in outside of practice, um, he's taken right to it. You know, he's, he's taken right to it. He's in the gym in the morning. Um, if, if we have an early practice, he's in there later. Uh, and then, you know, you combine and be a great student. He can finish like 3-7 first uh, quarter. So he's, 
he's, he's, uh, he's here to work, man. He's very focused. Um, he knows what he wants out of this situation. And he's taking the man so far. And he's, he's, uh, he's looking forward, forward to a uh, good year. Okay. And, you know, my last question for you is, um, you know, as usual, the MIAA is loaded. Uh, what must be done for y'all to be the last team standing at the end of the year? Yeah, we – first of all, first of, we have to stay healthy. Okay. We, I mean, we got crushed with injuries last year. Uh, I think our starters missed a total – I think it was 32 games. <laughs> Right. And uh, of those 32, 21 of them were Montez or, or Magic. So, um, you know, when, when you're talking about a roster, and, and on that roster you have, you know, two top 100 guys, and you're talking about those guys missing more than half of your games, that changes your roster. <laughs> you know, that, that changes your, your, the things you can do. Um and your personnel, obviously. So we we have to stay healthy. We have to stay healthy. And it, and it wasn't really anything anybody could do. Were, they were just, you know, injuries that are a part of the game. And, uh, you know, so first and foremost, man, we have to stay healthy this year. Um, and then we, we have to stay focused on us, you know. Uh, we have to stay focused on on what we're trying to accomplish every day in practice. Uh, we have to have great practices every day. And I, I think if we can do those two things, man, uh, you know, if things will take care of themselves. But, you know, we've been playing a great league. You know, obviously, St. Joe is, is just a phenomenal program. And Coach Flashy has done an unbelievable job over there. Um, and you have, you know, St. Francis, where Coach Miles does a great job. And he, he definitely uh, reloaded it, it has some great guys over there uh, the young kid ate the monster uh, and then Calvert Hall and, and uh, even even you know some of the MIAA schools McDonough and, you know it, it's just a great team man. a lot of great players a lot of great coaches uh, and, and you know right there with the WCAC you know the, the, the New York City the New York City League, the Philly League, I mean, it, it, it has to be one of the better leagues. <laughs> no doubt. And it's been, uh, it's been a pleasure being a part of that. You know, last year, obviously, we, we would like to finish a different way, but, you know, uh, was in the cards. So we're, we're definitely looking forward to this year. All right, Coach, I just want to thank you so much for calling in, man. We wish you nothing but success this season. Um, and, and we wish you, uh, we wish your team very good health, uh, along the uh, way. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. I, I appreciate you guys uh, and, and all the coverage you guys had on us, man. We really appreciate it. It's great for the kids. And, uh, know that, know that I really appreciate you guys and the work that you do. We truly appreciate that. Uh, so on behalf of Cardell, I'm going to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good night, boss. Thanks, man. You guys be good. All right, man. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Thank you so much again to Coach uh, John Zito for calling in. Had a great time talking to him. Shared a lot of great insight. Um, I thought it was cool because he's coming from the college level to the high school level and how he holds the kids accountable mm -hmm. um, from a collegiate standpoint. So when you make the jump, right. you shouldn't be too shocked by it. Where we, all, we have all heard stories about, you know, when you make, make that jump to college, sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's a shock to some player systems. Yeah. So, uh, you know, very great to hear that. Thank you so much for calling in. Going to take a quick break, and when we get back, Octavia's segment, which should be kind of interesting because her Eagles didn't play, so it shouldn't be as smug. But we'll see what happens. You're watching The Focus. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Welcome back. You are watching The Focus, in, in case you forgot or you just tuned in. Either way, we truly appreciate you uh, doing so. Uh, if you did just tune in, um, you missed a great conversation with Coach John Zito from John Carroll. Um, and you, I guess you, you're right on time for Octavia's NFC segment. <laughs> so without further ado, Octavia, the floor is yours. <laughs> so I, I'm not going to be too hard on everybody this week, I don't think. Um, but we're going to start with the Giants. Um, the Giants are now currently 1-9, still fourth in the N NFC East. And they gave the 49ers their first win this week, losing 31-21. 
um, I've grown like sad watching their games. Like, I honestly don't want to watch them anymore, but I only watch them for the segment. When you say them, <laughs> that could apply to both teams, but. Well, you know, I, I hold a. <laughs> It's, it's so disheartening, but um, Eli Manning was 28-37, 273 yards, um, two touchdowns. He also lost a fumble. Um, Orleans Darkwa, 14 carry, 70 yards. Sterling Shepard, 11 of 13, uh, 142 yards. So, I mean, it, their offense still isn't really there. Um, their defense is horrible right now. Janoris Jenkins got burnt, like, more than once. Um, of course, the one with Marquise Goodwin, who scored on 83-yard touchdown pass from C.J. Beathard, you know, that one was kind of terrible. <laughs> so, um, you know, at this point, I don't even really know what to make of the, of the Giants. You know, one stat that stood out to me is that every game that they have played this year, a tight end has scored a touchdown on them. Every single game. They have not been able to stop any tight ends. Uh, Brett Selleck scored, you know, this week as well um, from the 49ers. So, Garrett. Yeah. Brent, you guys. Garrett, you were, you I'm sorry, the, the brothers. Brother. I'm sorry. We had the worst brother. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cardell, if you see it, it took him an hour with no one in front of him to run 60 yards. Yeah, it was kind of painful. It was a little painful to watch. <laughs> if, you, if you understand, I had my own issues. Oh, I'm sorry. Brother, so. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, um, I mean, yeah, to be honest, I don't even know who they play next week. Does it matter? It doesn't <laughs> at this point. <laughs> uh, on to the next. Uh, Redskins uh, are now 4-5, and five, third in the NFC East. They lost to the Vikings this week, 38-30. to 30. Their next game is against the Saints. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you haven't heard about the Saints on the seven-game winning streak, it, and I mean, like killing people in the in the process. You say easy work. Okay. I mean, like <laughs> I mean, like demolishing people in the process. Um, Kirk Cousins ended. He was twenty six of forty five, three hundred and twenty seven yards, one touchdown, and one interception. Um, Perion had nine carries for thirty five yards. Jameson Crowder was four on eleven targets for seventy six yards. And surprise, they pulled a wide receiver off of the practice squad. I believe it was his first catch of the game. He should have been and, it, year, but. and it was an amazing one hand catch in the corner of the, well, in the front by the pylon of the end zone that it was initially called not a score. They went back, reviewed it, and he caught it. And it was easily one of the greatest catches this season um, across the league. So that was definitely a, a, a bright spot for them. Hopefully they'll keep him around and see if he can continue to produce those type of things. But we'll see. Um, to be honest, it's just the Redskins defense was just really, really bad this week. And it wasn't a, as a whole. It was the the D, the, the secondary. Um, and Josh Norman has already come out and, and said that they just played horrible. You know, um, he got burned, you know. Although uh, Swearinger was the one bright spot for them, you know, he did get two interceptions on back-to-back -back passes by Case Keenum. But Case Keenum was lighting them up in the first half. I mean, I think he had four of his touchdown passes in the first half. Um, so, the one good part as well, the Redskins did get most of their offensive linemen back this week. Um, Spencer Long still, you can see he's not 100%. You know, he didn't start. He did get in for a couple of series, but he ultimately was out for majority of the game. Um, but, you know, it's just at this point, you know, the Redskins still have a chance. You know, they, they still have a, a slim chance, but this next game next week against the Saints is going to be a must win, and it's going to be a tall task for them to handle. So, we'll see what happens. Um, on to the next, we have the Cowboys, who are now 5-4, and four, second in the NFC East, and they also lost to the Falcons 27-7. Their next game is going to be a division game against the Eagles. Um, Dak Prescott ended with 20 of 30, 176 yards, and one rushing touchdown. Um, he had 42 rushing yards as well. Uh, Alfred Morris, 11 carries, 53 yards, and Jason Witten, 7-7 seven seven for 59 yards. Um, all in all, you, you can see that missing Zeke, missing um, Sean Lee, who had a, a hamstring injury and left after the second quarter, well, in the second quarter, and then also their um, left tackle, Tyron Smith, was out. Dak was sack, sacked eight times, and that's not even count how many times he was hurried, knocked, pushed down, all those things you want to call. Um, so it's hard for any team to win a game when your quarterback is most of the time on the ground instead of upright. Um, so it, it's 
it's going to be a difficult situation for them if they don't find a way to get their running game started again with, like I said, Alfred Morris was rushing for 53 yards and Dak had 42. So the quarterback was like 11 yards underneath that. So um, they definitely have some holes to fill. Um, see if Sean Lee will be, you know, I'm pretty sure. I feel like he'll muster up the energy to play this week just because it is a big division game. It's a Sunday night game. Um, but we'll see what happens. We'll see, you know, what they're going to do with the running game. Because, you know, as much as they depended on Zeke and as much as he, you know, was the focal point to open up everything else for them, it, you can tell that it's going to take some time for them to get in a new groove to figure it out. Um, you know, Dak does have a lot of pressure on his shoulders at this point, you know, to, in my opinion, to kind of dispel rumors that from the past that, you know, he's not that great of a quarterback. He just had a great offensive line and he has a great running back. Um, so, you know, he didn't throw a touchdown. He didn't throw an interception. He did rush for one, but that was the only offense that they had for the entire game. Um, it was a must win also for the Falcons, which they came out and they won and they needed to. And they also have some injuries. You know, Devontae Freeman got um, out with a concussion as well. Um, so it's going to be, you know, interesting next week as well. Of course, the Eagles didn't play this week, had a bye, still 8-1, still first on NFC East. Um, but it'll be a big game this week, um, Sunday night. Looking forward to it. So I can talk a lot of trash. <laughs> Although my Eagles did not play this week, it's always a lovely situation when everybody else in the NFC East loses, which this happened. So, I mean, I'm excited, you know, to continue going on and, and see what happens. See, it wasn't that bad. Look, she found a way exactly. to throw the Eagles exactly. in at the end. I like, I thought to. we were going to get out of it. No, I did. Seeing that no, it was a bye week, no? Know, I don't know. Okay. I don't know why I, you well, thought that. I don't know why I did either. Shame on me, right? Shame. Shame, Shame on me. You know me. Facts. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> on to more facts. Uh, big game last night at College Park. Um, reigning, the reigning champs, number two team in the country, South Carolina, came down, well, came up uh, to Maryland Bradley to take on the Maryland Terrapins. Um, new look Terrapin team. It was a good test for both teams. We learned a lot. Um, as Dawn Staley said, her and Brenda both felt like that's the, that's the reason that they scheduled this game was for both of them to learn about their respective teams. Obviously, South Carolina has Asia Wilson, and she was tremendous. Um, but really, to me, it was Alexis Jennings in the first half that really got stuff started for them because Maryland came out of the zone, and I think, you know, in the hopes of what teams go in the zone and kind of try to limit the touches to a big – but, you know, it's hard to rebound out of a zone. Right. And against a, a great rebounding team like South Carolina, that hurt Maryland for nearly three quarters. They got down 26, and credit to Maryland, they didn't, they didn't blink. Down 26, really young team. And the switch, I think the ticket energy because they're a young team, I think mentally when you're playing zone, you have to be a little bit more engaged mentally than physically in zone because it's more, it's more taxing mentally. And when she made the switch to go man-to-man, -man, and I was telling Jarrell this all game. I felt just as a younger team, Maryland's going to take off. They're, they're a young team. They play off their instincts. They're a really fast team. And sure, sure enough, as soon as they, they switch the zone, they switch out the zone like maybe with three minutes left in the third. And Maryland went on a massive run. Cut the lead to three at a point. Cut it to five. Went back down by ten. Cut it to five. I think they ended up losing by five or seven hey. due to free throws. But Kyla Charles had four points at the half. And some of the zone kind of took away – you know, her playing with the great athletic abilities that she has and some of the other Maryland players, they're big on the wing. And when they got out the run and they went the man, sure, Aja Wilson uh, scored here and there. But when Maryland got the rebound, they're so much faster than they were last year. You know, Kyle was playing the four. At, some, at one point last night, she was the five. So she's getting a rebound. She can put the ball on the floor. She outraced the entire South Carolina team up the court, putting pressure on their defense. And they didn't really have an answer for her. But for Maryland... You should be happy knowing going for, going forward that you have a mentally tough team. It's easy for a young team to just throw like throw in a towel. You're down 26. You don't have to keep fighting. And not only did they fight, but they really put a scare in South Carolina. And credit to South Carolina's point guard. She did a great job last night of kind of trying to regain the tempo back from Maryland after they snatched it. It was literally all Maryland from three minutes left in the third quarter until the end of the game. The crowd was dead for three quarters, wow. and it was crazy in there. Um, Cardell, you, you were me last year at the UConn-Maryland game. Yeah. So that crowd got, didn't get to like that level until the fourth quarter. And you could tell like it started to affect South Carolina a little bit. But the big thing for Maryland, they didn't even shoot the ball well last night. It mostly came to just youthful turnovers early on, and they just can't play slow. I think that's going to be a thing where some of the players mature. They might be able to play slower. 
this team just has to play fast. And they really might just have to stay out the zone until they can grow up, grow up mentally to get to a place where they can stay disciplined enough mm-hmm. to play it. Because literally when they went zone, it was just – and South Carolina did the right thing. You got, you got a 6'6 six, six center, a 6'4 six, forward, a 6'4 power forward. They're sealing their man. Maryland's fronting in the zone. You drop it over the top, it's easy lay-ins. Mm-hmm. They got in foul trouble. But Maryland was able to hold their own man-to-man situation. So, you know, definitely plenty of positives. Uh, Kyla Charles with his 27-point second half, mm-hmm. 21 in the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. And this is something Brenda talked about over the summer was that's their go-to player, and she showed it. It took a while, but that's who's Maryland's, that's one of Maryland's leaders this year. And that's who they kind of have to rally behind and, and, and play with, man. But um, not bad. They, they, they got a game on Thursday morning. They head up to Connecticut to take on, I think, the number one team in the country on Sunday. That's going to be another great test. No matter what happens, at, you know, after this week, you, got this, you get to say you play the top two teams in the country, neither of which are in your conference in the Big Ten, come conference play in January. So you get a, lot, get a chance to find out who you are as a team. No, no. All right, man, um, and we got more coverage. Um, GW Howard, Maryland, South Carolina, get over to findersmag.com, get over to mymodelsports.com, and always, you know, just follow us along on social media here at The Focus TV. The Washington Wizards. Yep. Washington Wizards. We're going to go to a quick soundbite from Scott Brooks. When we get back, we're going to talk about uh, what's been going on with them since the last time we saw you guys. Passing, defending after the first you know, six minutes. Defense was good. A lot of a lot of good um, on the ball defense, a lot of good help defense, um, and then the passing. 30 assists, and you know, John doesn't even get double digit assists, and that's probably rare. Uh, Brad and John, you know, 16 assists between them. We moved the ball, and, you know, we didn't even make our threes in that first half, but we got a lot of, got a lot of good looking threes. So um, I'm pleased with the way we play, I'm pleased with the way we finished off our homestand. Uh, we held the last uh, three games in the 90s. Now we got to go do it on the road. He was uh, really good. He was, yeah, man. Uh, uh, rolling Washington his... Wizards. Uh, kind of a different theme from the last time we were talking about this team. So, Cardell, <laughs> tell everybody what's been going on. Um, simple. They improved their defense. Um, last three games, the three and since the Dallas game, where you know they look like they still weren't. It's, paying attention that they need to defend. Um, they turned it up. And um, the last three games, they're 3-0. And uh, Since the loss of Dallas, um, they've averaged, they've kept every team under 100 points, which people don't know is when they keep teams under 100 points, they're 49-8 over the last three years. So that tells you their success is built off their defense. Um, ironically, last night, the effort defensively led to big leads where Wall and the starters basically, Bill and all those guys basically got, got a chance to rest most of the fourth. Hold on, I'm sorry. Are you saying that their bench contributed? Yeah, you know, so, you know, and, uh, and um, I'm going to get to that. So, you know, the one thing that they were kind of avoiding actually helps them achieve the thing that they want to achieve, you know, winning and wrestling in the fall. It's, it's funny how it worked out that way. But the biggest um, upgrade, you know, has been the improvement Kelly Uber. Um, I think he's in the running for six, of the year, six man of the year. Um, yet he's averaging a career high, you know, 11.6 points, 6.1 rebounds, but he's doing it efficiently. Uh, 41% from three, you know, 81% from the free throw line. You have to deal with him. Not to mention, he's a lockdown defender. He's probably the best defender on the team, um, give and take, man. You know, I know a lot of people give that credit to Wall, but Wall sometimes gamble too much. But it's really Uber. He's the lockdown defender. When they need to stop, they're going to put Uber on him. And the fact that he's doing that, Scott Brooks say, I'm going to give you a little rope offensively. And he's proving he deserves that little rope. So, you know, he's thriving. He's improving. And that makes that when he comes off the bench, it's like another star. And that's big for the Wizards, especially if they're going to have to make some noise in the playoffs. You know, we all know who they have to deal with. Not just LeBron, but the Greek freak and yeah. know, Ben Simmons. So they're going to they need him to be productive on both ends. Also, you know, Brad Bill, he's playing at an all-star level. Um, he's averaging about 23.8 points a game, 4.8 rebounds, 3.5 assists, 49% field goal percentage, 35 from three, 82 from the free throw line. Um, I think he's the best two guard. He has emerged as the best two guard in the Eastern Conference, you know. So, um, obviously, I wish you got Clay with the ring, so I can't put him above that guy yet. But after that, it's a toss-up, and he's playing like he deserves that accolade. 
And then also, um, I, I know this thing in the, at the power forward, Marquise Morris and Mike Scott. That combination is daily. Uh, I see teams having fits. It, it, like last year, Marquise would do his thing, but when he went to the bench, teams kind of exhale yeah. like, "Yeah, we got a break." You don't get that break. <laughs> you know, they're both skilled. They're both versatile. About power four, six nine. They can guard multiple positions. They rebound. And they're tough. You're not gonna punk them or anything like that. And then um, tomorrow they take on the eight and they're eight and five, and tomorrow they take on the Heat. And, you know, then they return back home Friday to host the Heat again. So yeah. it's a back-to-back, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, that's – I think the the biggest thing you talked about that I hope people realize is the fact that there's no drop-off when you go to the bench now. Like, mm-hmm. literally, you got you got two starters coming off the bench, Lisa, in my mind, and, and Mike and Kelly. Yeah, right? no doubt. And, so, and shout out to Tim for holding it. Like, yes. he, he's the perfect backup for Wall. Yeah. He comes in and he just runs the show. He don't plays out, outside of himself. He's not trying to prove anything. He just keeps it going. Yep. He is either going the lead going to be the way it is, or he's going to help that lead grow. It's not the last couple of years where John sits down and everything goes to you know what. And then they got to come back to yeah. the rescue. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> like uh, two games ago, not against the Kings, two games ago, because I didn't go last night, two games ago, we watched them. The, the bench closed the game out with eight minutes left. Mm-hmm. Like the starters got to do, they got to live that Golden State life for a hot <laughs> second. Kick your feet up, take off your shoes, no worries. They out there going on a run. Like, the bench started the quarter with a 10-0 run. Like, we we got this. Don't worry about it. And we've been telling you guys about Kelly way before the season started. Training camp. Over and over again, we, we've, we've told you guys this. So, us here at The Focus, we're not going to do the whole surprise thing. This is what we expected. It's what we talked about. This is what we foresaw. So, kudos to the kid for doing what he needed to do. Saw him last night with a quick the little one-two step with the dunk mm-hmm. on Buddy Hill. Sorry to put you out there, but that was you that got snatched. I mean, the picture's up. Yeah. He's out there. He got snatched. You know, came out to Kelly standing straight up like the old scouting report. Obviously, somebody needs to update that scouting report. If you come with the hard clothes out, he's comfortable putting the ball down there. Um, and it's just good because defensively, they have what it takes to be a very good defensive team. It's just about doing it. Mm-hmm. And what we've seen for the last three games and when they do it, um, that stat you brought up, there's, I think they're like second to only Golden State. No, nah, they're a it's little bit behind, third? but like fourth or fifth. Fourth? Okay, so win percentage-wise, but yeah. Um, like I said, it comes back to them and credit the wall. He he was kind of getting beat up, you know, because yeah. a couple of them, like Dennis Smith took a tone, was getting a triple-double. Ever since then, he's been in lockdown mode. He's kind of been setting the tone, even running down plays and getting big blocks. Mm-hmm. Team feeds off that. You the leader, you got to do that. Yeah, hey, I mean, uh, credit the wall and Bill, both of them. For them to be, you know, the type of backcourt they, they feel that they are, for them is on the defensive end. We know what right. they can do offensively. Mm-hmm. And they have, because of their physical gifts, they have the abilities – in the East Coast, in the Eastern Conference, to really lock down mostly every other, or at least slow, every other backcourt in the East. And they're going to have to because what people don't know is they get the West the credit. The East is actually beating the West right now head-to-head, head, and the East is tougher than what people thought. So if they're not on their game, they can be going home earlier than what they expected. Very early. But thank you guys for tuning in, man. We truly appreciate it. we we'll see you guys next week, same time, same place. As always, get over to finestmag.com. Get over to mymodelsports.com. Follow us all on social media, specifically to Focus TV. And uh, thank you again for tuning in. Season that passed. Um, season that passed. Um, what did you learn about yourself this season? Um, well, uh, there was a stretch when we played Denver, Atlanta, and New England. So we were way at Denver, home to both Atlanta and New England. And, you know, <clears throat> Uh, I was, you know, put in the position of, you know, being a sub like the last 10 minutes of the uh, of the game in Denver, and we end up getting the result 1-0, and then, you know, being told that I'll have to play in, uh, against our home on Wednesday against Atlanta, you know, and getting the result, and then having the, the game against New England, and, you know, for the first time playing back-to-back games, and it was like a big responsibility for me to you know, not only win, but now can we keep clean sheets at home and back to back? And you know, for the first time, it was like I've been, I was tested like that, and I felt like when I was called upon, I did well. I, uh, in, in terms of that experience, piggyback with that, do you feel like you gained confidence going through those types of those types of for scenarios? Sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, how I, I mean, you know, when I played those games, I was you know still nervous because like, I just had been almost thrown in, mm-hmm. but, you know, when I got in the games versus Columbus, Portland, and, you know, the uh, New York game, the last game, uh, I just felt like 
I was more calm with the ball, I was more possessed. Uh, I wanted to pass it around, and I just felt very comfortable with it. All right, um, obviously with the back line, you guys are going to be comfortable with whoever's sure. in that. Uh, but, you know, just dealing with reality. For sure. Uh, has it registered that next year, no matter who it is behind you, it's not going to be built for like the first time? Yeah. Maybe some time. Well, the thing is, I, so the last couple of games this year, I was playing with Steve. Mm -hmm. And we got really comfortable with, with each other. And even in practice, I was training with Steve. Okay. So, you know. I, I know that presence a little more than maybe other guys. Right. So, yeah, so I feel pretty comfortable with that. Okay, great. Um, and <laughs> after the year that just passed, Coach talked a lot about just, just moments that have passed. That's the difference between, you know, having a good year and a bad year sometimes. For sure. Um, just in terms of capitalizing those moments, do you guys feel like maybe the next year you, after going through this, should be more prepared to when those moments pop up to, to, to own those moments? For sure, because, you know, now we have the off season to look at what we did wrong and, you know, to improve on that. So, you know, I say this, you know, honestly, like we can't go backwards. Right. Like the only direction's up from here. So we got to improve in those moments and, you know, just just keep on, you know, improving. All right, it's, it's very important. You know, obviously it's three levels. Uh, you guys in the back line and the, the group that plays in front of you. Mm -hmm. You've got a, some new pieces added, uh, some younger pieces. Uh, you've gotten a chance at times this year, towards the end of the year, to see what that group may look like or how they've played in front of you guys. And in relationship to them being in front of you, you feel like that group might be special for the, for the coming seasons? For like sure. Group yeah, absolutely. I mean, having Russ come back, having Paul join us, even Zoltan, and I mean, it just, you know, like, we instantly gel. Like, you know, they're friendly guys and like, uh, outside of, you know, the field, but on the field, it's like, you know, they're competitors and, you know, we made mistakes because like we didn't know each other, right. like our tendencies and whatnot. But this off season is really going to push for us to like grow together. And then you know, preseason, you know, after that, there's no excuse. Like it's it's, it's a good team. It's going to be a good team going forward, young, and I think there's a lot of promise. All right. Then lastly, not related to to on the field, uh, you guys going through off season workouts right now. Mm -hmm. Which uh, which ideal thing to listen to was was in your earbuds right now. You know, most importantly is for me, you know, especially as a center back or as a defender, um, to not concede goals. And that starts with training. Um, you know, we watch film about the goals that we've given up and, you know, what can you do more? And it's now it's like, all right, I have to work on my position. I have to work on communicating and this and that. So right now it's important that, you know, I take that next step to eliminate the goals that we gave up this year.